This is going to be a quick video discussing the topic of density. Uh, I find generally this is not a topic students tend to struggle with, uh, but it is going to be a topic that comes up throughout the year as well as our first formal lab report. So I do like to take a little bit of time to uh, familiarize or at least re-familiarize you guys uh, with this particular idea. So first, uh, let's go over a quick list of the learning objectives. Uh, first of all, your job is to be able to explain how density affects the characteristics of an object. Some objects have high densities, some objects have low densities. How are those going to appear different to you uh, as the observer? So we need to go over that quick discussion. Uh, secondly, uh, our job is to be able to explain what affects density at the atomic level. There has to be a cause for these changes in densities, why object A has a high density and why object B has a low density. Uh, and that happens at the atomic level, so we'll explain that. That might be something that's a little newer uh, in terms of the discussion we're having today. Uh, thirdly, uh, to be able to use the density formula itself, I'll provide you with the formula and you need to be able to manipulate it algebraically in order to solve for a particular variable. And then finally, and this might be the newest idea of all, uh, is to be able to use density as a conversion factor. If you've already watched the video on um, dimensional analysis, uh, density is just another conversion factor, uh, often though it's not seen as that, so I make sure that I'll make you, sure you guys can see that. Uh, and then also be able to do the calculations that go along with it. So let's start with a quick definition on what density actually is. The official definition, if you go and look it up, is the amount of matter per unit volume of a substance. So really quickly here, uh, let's talk about what these two terms mean. We've got the term matter right here. Uh, matter is the physical stuff that takes up the uh, that fills up the universe around us, the stuff that you guys can interact with, and then we've got the term volume over here, which is the amount of space that that matter takes up. So we're talking about how much matter can fit in a certain amount of space, and again, depending on the substance you're dealing with, that might be a lot of matter, or it might be a little bit of matter. So let's talk about an example of what I'm, I'm dealing with here. We have uh, in front of us two separate suitcases. Uh, I tried to find suitcases that were as similar to one another as possible. Uh, and the goal here is to have suitcases that are pretty much the same size. Now let's assume that this suitcase over here on the left is full. It's got all your stuff in it ready to travel. Uh, and this suitcase over here on the right is empty. Maybe you're traveling with friends or family. They haven't taken the time to actually pack yet. Uh, both suitcases have the same volume. But because this one is full, it's going to have a lot of mass in it. And this one's going to have very little mass. So even though they appear the same, uh, they're going to be different in terms of the amount of mass that they have. As a result, a large amount of mass and a similar amount of volume is going to give this guy a larger density. Whereas this guy over here with his smaller amount of mass, still in the same volume, is going to have a smaller density. So again, this is a very common application of how density applies to us. Now the interesting thing here is that in our lives, uh, most of the substances we deal with uh, fall in a very, very small range of densities. Uh, therefore, you don't see this happen all a lot, but this is actually one of the cases you might have run into uh, where density became a factor into your life. When you go to pick this suitcase up, your brain looks at it, it sees how big it is, it knows what the suitcase is made of, and it makes an approximation to gear your muscles up to make the appropriate lifting force to get that suitcase off the ground. Now, if you thought you had this suitcase in front of you, the full one, and it turned out you accidentally had this suitcase in front of you, the empty one, you're going to gear up for a lot more work than you actually need to do. And the end result is you'll grab the suitcase and you'll flip it up into the air really fast. Uh, and a lot of us may have dealt with this. Anytime you're dealing with a container that you might assume is full and it turns out it's empty, you end up overlifting it. Um, so hopefully that's something you guys have seen before, but I think that's one of the more common applications uh, of how density affects us on a day-to-day -day life. 
So let's talk about some examples of density as it deals with real elements. Uh, we got two substances here. On the left, as you can plainly see written on the bar, we have the element gold. And its symbol is AU. Uh, you probably haven't held large quantities of gold based on how expensive it typically is, but gold actually has a very, very high density among elements, one of the highest out of all of them. A gold has a density of 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Here's your mass. And here's your volume here. We'll talk more about this unit a little bit later on. So that means every cubic centimeter, every um, little space about the size of the end of your pinky finger has about 19.3 grams in it. That might not mean a lot about to you right now because you don't handle a lot of gold, but let's talk about another element and maybe talk about some comparisons here. This block, uh, even though it doesn't say it, is a block of aluminum. Its symbol is AF. Aluminum also has a density, and its density is 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. And as you can see, the density here for aluminum is significantly lower uh, than the density over here uh, for our brick of gold. This means that between the two of these, that gold is approximately seven times heavier per cubic centimeter than the actual piece of aluminum is. And if you can think about how aluminum feels when you peel off a piece of aluminum foil, uh, you can imagine that aluminum foil weighing seven times heavier for the same volume, the same amount of space, and you'd be dealing with a foil of, that's made of gold as opposed to a foil that's made of aluminum. So again, this is, again is another example of how density plays a role here in the behavior of these two elements. We got a very, very heavy, very dense substance here when we have gold. Uh, and we have a very, very light, very low density substance over here, uh, which is aluminum. Next, we'll talk a little bit about why uh, these differences might occur. And again, we're going to stick with our gold and our aluminum analogies here. Over here on the left, we have a symbol, a Bohr model, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that later in the year, of a gold atom. And what I want you to notice here is a gold atom is made up of tons and tons of stuff. These little E's here represent electrons. And inside the nucleus, which is what this blue dot's representing, we have 79 protons and 118 neutrons. A lot of matter squeezed into the space of one atom. Let's move on to our gold, our silver, I'm sorry, our aluminum atom over here. Uh, and we can see similar arrangement of stuff, but notice the numbers are significantly lower. So here's our aluminum. We have a very a much fewer number of electrons and a much fewer number of neutrons and protons. As a result, we've got smaller amounts of matter uh, pretty much occupying comparable spaces. Uh, these atoms actually do have different sizes to them, uh, but in the grand scheme of the world from a larger perspective, we can assume the size of these, is a re these guys are relatively similar to one another. And again, notice in this scenario, we've got a lot of matter squeezed into that space. And in this scenario, we've got a very small amount of matter squeezed into this place. And this is the start this is the start of our explanations of things that might affect density. Why do some substances like gold have a high density, whereas other substances like aluminum have a low density? Well, that first factor we can talk about, we just already mentioned, uh, is the fact that the masses of the individual atoms. Um, when we're dealing with a bigger mass, like for example, with the gold atom, um, we tend to have a larger amount of matter we tend to have more matter per unit of area which means a higher density recall the definition from before so one of the factors that might affect the density of substance is having bigger mass elements. And generally speaking, as you get larger and larger elements on the periodic table, their densities do tend to increase. However, that is not always the case. There are cases where we have larger atoms that have lower densities than others. And the explanation for that then, uh, the second half of the piece here, which is how the atoms pack together. When those atoms arrange themselves in the elements, 
uh, if they arrange themselves very closely packed together, uh, for example, we could draw a very closely arranged group of circles here, each circle representing an atom, we would imagine that this substance would have a higher density because this is very closely packed. And actually, this arrangement of atoms is known as hexagonal close packing. This close packing causes a lot of those atoms with all their matter to be squeezed into a small amount of space. Likewise, we can go over to here, say we have something like a liquid or a gas which loses that structure. Now we've got atoms, but they're very loosely packed together. There's a lot of space in between them. As a result, this guy's going to have, so we'll call this loosely packed. This guy's going to have a much lower density. And again, what it really boils down to is it's a combination of both of these two things. Having a larger mass tends to give you a larger density. Having closer packed uh, atoms tend to give you a larger density. Uh, but in actuality, like I said, every substance is, is a combination of uh, the two of these things. And that, again, explains some of the patterns and trends we see in the periodic table uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later in the year. Now that we have a decent understanding of uh, the actual explanation behind what density is. Let's talk a little bit about some of the mathematics you guys are going to be responsible for. And the thing we'll start with is the actual density equation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a relatively simple equation. We have our term density here is going to be equal to the mass of your object on the top divided by its volume. And that's pretty much as hard as it gets. And usually these calculations involve plugging in two out of the three of these uh, and solving for whatever missing variable is present. Um, typically we don't write all the words out. Uh, typically we write this as just D equals M over V. And this here, uh, this D equals M over V is the equation you really want to kind of remember and be able to work with. Um, some people prefer, for example, to have different formats of this. Uh, for example, we can solve for mass separately uh, by multiplying both sides by the volume. Uh, and we can solve for the volume separately by uh, dividing both sides by the density. Uh, all three of these equations, each one of them solves for a different variable. This guy on the top obviously solves for density. This guy solves for mass. This guy solves for volume. Uh, and depending on the type of problem, you'll be asked to solve for one of the three of these. I actually think it's in your best interest to stick with the main equation. Focus on knowing d equals m over v, and then trust in your algebra to solve for these other two equations as needed. Uh, as opposed to trying to memorize three of these. I'm always uh, an advocate of the more equations you try to memorize, uh, the more likely you're going to memorize something incorrectly. So stick with this guy, keep this guy in your head, and then use your algebra to get to these individual other equations as necessary. Uh, now, I'm not going to dive too much into an actual practice calculation with this. That's something we can talk about in class if necessary. But again, I find most people don't struggle with this particular calculation too much. What I do want to talk about uh, is the idea of units that go along with this. Uh, basically, units are going to be any mass unit divided by any volume units. we got mass units divided by volume units. Our mass units, for example, can be grams. Uh, they can be kilograms. They can be pounds. They can be tons. Anything that records the mass of a unit, although pounds and tons don't technically record mass, but anything that records a mass can be used as your mass unit. Volume uh, is commonly either milliliters, cubic centimeters, cubic meters, uh, gallons, anything you can think of that requires the volume of a thing can be used. Now commonly there are units that are used um, more regularly than others. In the world of the sciences, uh, we tend to deal with grams per cubic centimeter or we tend to deal with grams per milliliter. These are the most common groups that you're going to be dealing with out there. Um, more technically speaking or more commonly used, uh, outside of our lab anyway, uh, kilograms per cubic meter uh, is used very frequently. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Although unfortunately a lot of other industries use their own individual units for density to match the type of measurements that they use. The ones you're going to want to focus most of your efforts on 
are going to be these two guys right here. And actually, it's important to note that a cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter. So these values are actually pretty much the same. Milliliters means you measured it as a liquid, whereas cubic centimeters means you measured it with a ruler and did a length times width times height. But a milliliter, by definition, is a cubic centimeter. So those are the units you're going to be working with. Uh, all the answers you calculate should have one of these units associated with it. The last thing I want to talk about before we wrap things up is the ability to use density as a conversion factor. I think out of all the things we've tell, talked about today, this is the least obvious of them. I find something students struggle with the most. Uh, what density does is it allows us to convert between the units of mass, any unit we want, uh, and any, into any volume unit that we want to deal with, depending on the units of density that are provided from us. Uh, for example, if we go back to our idea from before, which was gold, we said that gold had a mass of 19.3 grams per every one cubic centimeter. This would allow us then to convert from cubic centimeters into grams by putting cubic centimeters on the bottom. Again, we're referring back to uh, dimensional analysis from earlier. Uh, if we put cubic centers down here, it would cancel out. Likewise, we could flip this conversion factor over and it would cancel out grams and convert us into how many cubic centimeters or the volume of the sample. Um, so as a quick example of that, uh, we got something here. It looks uh, like a pretty standard problem here. What is the volume of a 1,000 gram brick of gold? So we're going to start, again, with our dimensional analysis with the number that we are given, 1,000.0 grams of gold. Put our multiplication sign in and align. We want to cancel out the grams unit, which means grams has to be on the bottom. And we want to convert into a volume, which means cubic centimeters are on the top. We take our numbers from above, and we see that for every 19.3 grams, we get one cubic centimeter. And again, grams, we'll cancel that with grams, and we'll get an answer that is just in cubic centimeters. So we use density to convert from the mass of our 1,000 gram brick of gold into a volume. Uh, if you do your math on your calculator, you'll find out you'll get an answer of approximately 51.8 uh, cubic centimeters of gold that we're dealing with here. Um, so that's pretty much it. This is the, what I'm looking you guys to be able to do. Uh, you'll find typically problems like this aren't quite this straightforward, um, but this density usage like this in a dimensional analysis problem will be buried in something a little more complex. So to wrap things up, uh, let's go over the learning objectives we talked about today and uh, make sure we hit all the uh, things we were meant to talk about. Uh, first of all, our job was to be able to explain how density affects the characteristics of an object. If you guys recall, we talked about the example uh, of an empty versus a full suitcase, and we talked about the example of having gold versus aluminum, how their different densities affected how we would um, kind of observe those. Our next uh, job was to be able to explain what affects density at the atomic level, and we identified two factors that affect density at the atomic level. We said the mass of the individual atom, as well as the, um, the packed, uh, how packed the atoms are. Very closely packed atoms are going to make something more dense, very loosely packed atoms are going to make something less dense. We then talked about the density formula very briefly and the ability to manipulate it algebraically, and then finally, we talked about how to use density as a conversion factor, uh, and we dealt with a quick example, thinking, figuring out what the volume of that 1,000 gram block of gold was dealing with.